Today we are going to look at a discovery by the greatest pure geometer since Apollonius, Steiner. Oh, you didn't know that? Jakob Steiner, a pupil of Pestalozzi, became Berlin's first professor of geometry, thanks to Alexander and Wilhelm von Humboldt. He worked in strictly synthetic morphology, pointing out that analysis removes you from the direct experience of truth. He taught without showing figures so that his students would learn to picture everything mentally. He wrote in polar formulations. Last time we looked at projection and that is what we are going to do now. Choose three points and two lines. They could be anywhere in the plane. This configuration gives you some chance of staying on the page. Choose a line in A. This gives a point in B, which gives, that is, determines, a line in C, which in turn gives a point in D which then gives a line in E. The line in E is projective to the line in A. And where they meet, mark a point. In red, for instance. Now if the line in A rotates a little bit, counterclockwise, can you picture what will happen to the rest of the figure? The point in B will slide downward, won't it? What will that do to the line in C? And what will that in turn do to the point in D? And hence the line in E? And what about the point marked in red? Pause if you want to try to picture it on your own. If the line in A rotates a little more in the same direction, it will pass right through C. Quiz. Where is the red point going to be then? Fine, then we'll skip that position. Well, if you aren't going to work it out on your own, you don't really deserve the answer, do you? We continue to, to rotate the line in A. Here, the line in C is parallel to D. To find the line in E, just set one end of your straight edge against the infinitely distant point of D, and the other against E. As you go through the alphabet from B through C to D, note that sometimes C might not seem to lie between B and D, but it does if you go around the long way. Without the infinitely distant points, the movement would have gaps. Here are the locations of the red point gener generated so far. If you want to see where it is between any two of these locations, you can just aim the line in A at the gap and generate the red point there. If one of the intersections lies off the page, tape more paper on and extend your lines. 
or use this Arg's triangle theorem, as shown in a previous installment, to find the next line without adding paper. Picture the line in A rotating steadily, and the red point will describe a continual curve. Out of movement, a curve takes shape. In anthroposophical terms, the spirits of movement precede the spirits of form. This curve has harmonious proportions. Metrical lawfulness arises out of freely chosen beginnings, as we have seen elsewhere. It is known in projective morphology as a curve of the second order, the straight line being the first order, and turns out to be a conic section. In other words, the points joining corresponding lines of two projective pencils, in this case A and E, plot a conic. The resulting curve happens to pass through A, E, and the intersection of B and D. So the next time you try this, you can cash in these three points automatically, free of charge. Why? When the line in A reaches the intersection of B and D, so will the line in C, and hence also the line in E. When the line in A reaches E, any line in E will, of course, intersect it right there. By the way, the second line in E will then be a tangent. And since projectivities associate the same elements in both directions, when the line in E reaches A, any line in A will, of course, intersect it right there. Consider also two more simple situations. When the line in A reaches C, it will be identical with the line in C. So its intersection with D will also be its intersection with the line in E. Therefore, the intersection of AC with D is another easy score. And when the line in A reaches the intersection of B with CE, then so will the line in C, and also the line in E. That makes five points you can get for almost no work. For those of you who know what a Pascal line is, the five free and easy points plus any sixth point on the curve have the moving line in C as their Pascal line. The Pascal line will come up in one of the next installments. Here is a second example of the same procedure. Can you picture the result? Try to picture everything in motion.
Again, the red point moves in a continual curve. This time, the curve passes through the infinitely distant line of the plane. Twice. All right. Time to polarize. Pause if you want to try it on your own. The lines joining corresponding points of two projective ranges envelop a conic. What does that mean? Is there any chance it could, by some marvelous coincidence, be true? Let's try it out. Choose three lines and two points. They could be anywhere in the plane. This configuration gives you some chance of staying on the page. Choose a point in A. This gives a line in B, which gives a point in C, which in turn gives a line in D, which then gives a point in E. The point in E is projective to the point in A, and joining them, draw a line, in green for instance. Now if the point in A slides a, a little bit to the northeast, can you picture what will happen to the rest of the figure? The line in B will rotate clockwise, won't it? What will that do to the point in C? And what will that, in turn, do to the line in D? And hence, the point in E? And what about the line marked in green? Pause if you want to try to picture it on your own. Here we already have a special situation. When the point in A reaches the line joining B with CE. Then so will the point in C, and also the point in E. In other words, the line joining B with CE is a green line. Yes, the whole laziness corollary also applies in the polar version. We continue to shift the point in A. What the green line is, is a tangent. The point in A is about to reach E. Can you picture where that will put the green line? When the point in A reaches E, any point in E will of course join with it along E. By the way, the second point in E will then be a tangent point. Here the laziness corollary saves you the trouble of taping on more paper or using Desargues triangle theorem to construct the line in D. And yet another freebie. Why? When the point in A reaches BD, so will the point in C, and hence also the point in E. And since projectivities associate the same elements in both directions, when the point in E reaches A, any point in A will of course join with it along A. When the point in A reaches C, as it is about to do, it will be identical with the point in C. So the line joining it with D will also be the line joining it with the point in E. Therefore, the line joining AC with D 
is another easy scar. Without the infinitely distant points, the movement would have gaps. The point in A is about to go off the page. Pause if you want to picture what will happen when it is infinitely distant. Picture the point in A traveling steadily and the green line will wrap a continual curve. For those of you who know what a Brianchon point is, the five free and easy lines plus any sixth line on the curve, that is to say tangent, have the moving point in C as their Brianchon point. The Brianchon point will come up in one of the next installments. Here is another version of Steiner's pointwise conic construction. It is easier to predict, fills all gaps, and keeps you on the page. It works because five points suffice to determine a conic. That means Hafner's five free and easy points are interchangeable. You can start by choosing any five points and make any two of them A and E. then make two others A and E, and so on. You can also try this method with a tangled pentagon. Just take a moment to figure out how the projectivity runs. Like this, for instance. Then like this. And so on. Here is another kind of tangle. And of course, there is a corresponding version of Steiner's linewise conic construction. It is easier to predict, fills all gaps, and keeps you on the page. It works because five lines suffice to determine a conic. That means Hafner's five free and easy lines are interchangeable. You can start by choosing any five lines and make any two of them A and E then make two others A and E, and so on. It will prove helpful to start in the middle of the projectivity by choosing a point on C. Can you see where the next green tangent will lie? Pause if you want to picture it.
Now make two other lines A and E. and so on. This too works with tangled pentagrams. Is all of this too easy for you? Try it in three dimensions. And one more thing. Remember Desargues' triangle theorem? If two trilaterals are perspective from a line, they are perspective from a point. That goes for more than two as well. Here we see that this is a special case of Steiner's pointwise conic. The unlabeled yellow line is the locus of the intersections of projective lines in A and E. The straight line thus turns out to be a degenerate conic. Degenerate means it verges on invisibility. If the plane otherwise cutting the cone lies tangent to it, a straight line is the result. Now shift the pencil C out of the axis of perspectivity, leaving everything else as is, and as Angelo Ruvida has shown, the one group of corresponding corners of the trilaterals plots a conic. Likewise, if two or more triangles are perspective from a point, they are perspective from a line. Here we see that this is a special case of Steiner's line-wise conic. The unlabeled point on the red axis is the locus of the lines joining projective points in A and E. The point thus turns out to be a degenerate conic. Degenerate means it verges on invisibility. If the plane otherwise cutting the cone passes only through its vertex, a point is the result. Now shift the range C out of the center of perspectivity, leaving everything else as is, and the one group of corresponding sides of the triangle envelops a conic. Thus, Steiner's pointwise and linewise conics are a generalization of Desargues.